Let's read from the last book of the Old Testament, the prophet Malachi, from chapter 2, verse 17, which really belongs in chapter 3, all the way to chapter 3, verse 18. Prophet Malachi, beginning with chapter 2, verse 17. Ye have wearied the Lord with your words, yet ye say, Wherein have we wearied him? When ye say, Every one that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delighteth in them, or where is the God of judgment? Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. He shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old and as in the former years. And I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against false swearers and against those that oppress the hireling and in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right. And fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts, for I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed." Even from the days of your fathers, ye are gone away from mine ordinances, and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, Wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall the vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Your words have been stout against me, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, What have we spoken so much against thee? Ye have said, It is vain to serve God. And what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance, and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the proud happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are set up. Yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. Amen. Let us read again our text, Malachi 3, verses 2 through 6. But who may abide the day of his coming? 
And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as silver and gold that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old and as in former years. And I will come near to you to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against false swearers and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and to turn aside the stranger from his right, and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. For I am the Lord, I change not, therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Beloved, we need to consider very briefly Malachi 2 verse 16 in order to grasp the background of our text. God, you see, is bone weary and totally fed up, as it were, with the murmuring of the Israelites. This is the foolishness that they were saying. Everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Common grace. And more of the foolishness. Where is the God of judgment? That weary God. They were saying that God does not act in the affairs of men. They denied his providence. Where is he? He's not doing anything. They were saying that he is not righteous since he doesn't judge the wicked. They were saying in effect that he is evil since evildoers are good in his sight and he delights in them. And the Lord in heaven was fed up, as it were, with these wicked sayings. And if we ask who was it who were saying such things, it obviously wasn't the godly Israelites. It's true that sometimes believers wonder, why doesn't God punish the wicked? Why doesn't he punish them at least more quickly, more openly? How come they appear to get away with it? But in truth, our, the passage we read isn't describing what the godly are saying in 2 verse 17. What the godly are saying is described in chapter 3 verses 16 and 17. When they were speaking often one to another... And God wrote a book of remembrance for those who feared him, and feared him and thought upon his name. And God will take them up as his jewels. The people who are saying these evil things about the Lord in chapter 2 verse 17. Are the ones who are using stout or harsh words against God in chapter 3 verse 13. It's the ungodly in the church, the unbelieving, reprobate, carnal seed who are wearying God with foolish words. And they, when they say, where is the God of judgment? They don't want God to come and judge themselves. They don't even here want God to come and judge the godly in Israel because they're saying, Everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord. Instead, they wanted God to come and judge the pagan nations round about them. We know this because, in effect, this is the only option that is left. And that Israel showed this proclivity on other occasions in the Bible, as in Amos 1 and 2. So, in a sense, what they're saying in chapter 2, verse 17 is this. We are God's people, nominally at least they were, they were in the visible external church, 
we're struggling to make ends meet. And there are the pagans out there, and they seem to be doing really well. They're prospering, and we're not in the land of Judah. And where is the God of judgment? And the answer provided in Malachi, and this is why the chapter division is somewhat unfortunate, the answer is found in chapter 3, verse 1. Here is the God of judgment. Here is how we know that those who do evil are not good in the sight of the Lord. He does not delight in them. God is going to send the messenger of the covenant. He is the manifestation of God's judgment. Also his mercy and salvation, but here especially now his judgment, at least from the perspective of chapter 2, verse 17. And the messenger of the covenant mentioned in chapter 3, verse 1, the answer to the question is our Lord Jesus Christ and the one who comes before him, the messenger before the messenger of the covenant is John the Baptist. Chapter 3, verse 1, Behold, I, Jesus Christ, will send my messenger, John the Baptist, and he, John the Baptist, shall prepare the way before me, Jesus Christ, and so the Lord... Jesus Christ, whom you seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he, the coming Savior, the Messiah, shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. And if chapter 3, verse 1, tells us about his identity, who he is, the coming one, the messenger of the covenant, our text focuses more especially on his work, what he does. And he's compared to two things in verse 2, a refiner's fire and fuller's soap. And a fuller is a launderer who uses soap to clean clothes. And he is described in terms of two nouns, is Jesus Christ, a refiner and a purifier of silver and, as the text goes on to explain, also gold. And two verbs are used of him. He will purge and purify the sons of Levi. And so our text presents Jesus Christ, the messenger of the covenant, as the one who refines, who purges, and who purifies the sons of Levi. And we'll explain who they are more fully later. For now let's consider Christ's purifying the sons of Levi. Christ purifying the sons of Levi. The meaning, the corollary, and the reason. The meaning, the corollary, and the reason for Christ purifying the sons of Levi. God's answer to the wearisome words of the grumbling, ungodly Israelites was as unpalatable to them as it was unexpected. It was unpalatable to them because of the place to which the messenger of the covenant was going to come. They wanted him to come to Persia and hit their enemies or to Egypt and humble that proud and mighty nation. Instead, we read that God is going to come to Judah, the visible church. Now, God doesn't leave the heathen untouched, but the passage here doesn't even mention that he's going to punish them. And it's unpalatable too to these ungodly Israelites, because of the reason why he was going to come. The God of judgment comes in judgment to Judah and not Samaria or the Edomians because Judah's sins must be crying out louder for punishment. You see the trouble? They were asking, where is the God of judgment? And this wasn't what they were after at all. And within Judah, God 
sends the messenger of the covenant even to the temple. Which reveals that in the eyes of the Almighty, the temple and the goings on therein reveal it to be the greatest seat and den of iniquity in Judea. And whenever the messenger of the covenant comes to Judea, as it's called in the New Testament language, or Judah in the Old Testament language, and when he comes to the temple, where they were supposed to be in the presence of God daily, no one would be able to stand. The awesome majesty causes them to fall. No one can appear in his dreadful presence because he comes like a fierce fire. That's the teaching of verse 2. Who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and fuller's soap. And that last phrase indicates there is <coughs> mercy here because Christ comes not merely as a fire, which all by itself is devastating. He comes as a refiner's fire. And a refiner's fire is purposeful. And in terms of Christ and his work, it's also gracious. Here's the picture invoked by the text. There is gold and silver mixed with impurities. It's placed in a crucible of pottery. This in turn then is set in an oven or kiln typically several feet high and with an opening to allow the smoke to escape for underneath are hot coals. Often bellows would be used to create a greater draft and a fiercer heat the sort of heat we're talking about here is fierce because gold melts at 1064 degrees centigrade and silver at a mere 961 degrees centigrade. So with this intense heat, the impurities especially melt and then they run off and are removed and the refiner, the person who's busy doing this, setting up the apparatus, he sits and watches. And all this, of course, isn't simply a lesson in metallurgy. The reality to which this points is this. The sons of Levi, they are the impure metal. <coughs> the refiner's fire is the fire of the refiner who is Jesus Christ. He is like refiner's fire. He embodies the holiness of the triune God. And of course here we're talking hotter temperatures merely than that which melt metals <coughs> because he is a consuming fire. As Hebrews 12 says, quoting Deuteronomy. The refiner himself is also the messenger of the covenant, he and his fire being inseparable, and he watches, he watches the sons of Levi as they are refined in this intense heat. And this doesn't portray Jesus Christ as a sort of sadist who likes to see people being burned, but he's watching this process as the one who proposes and purposes the purity and salvation of the sons of Levi, not their pain as such, and certainly not their destruction. So here's the messenger of the covenant. He is effecting and he is watching the progressive purification of the sons of Levi run ahead of ourselves a little bit that's what he's doing with us he's watching we're in the crucible he sees us 
And again I say, not as a sadist, but as one who is purposing and effecting our good. And if we ask, how does Christ purify the sons of Levi? We note that here, the refining is not spoken of in terms of purification and trials as such. This is perhaps the dominant idea with refining fire in the Bible. To take one example, the Apostle Peter speaks of this in his first chapter. He refers to the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it the trial of your faith, it's being tried, your faith, with fire, with the gold that it might be found unto the praise and honor and glory of God at the appearing of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1 verse 7. But Malachi 2 doesn't, Malachi 3 rather, doesn't say anything about making the sons of Levi pass through trials and tribulations. And it doesn't take the Son of God coming in our flesh as the messenger of the covenant from our perspective 2,000 years ago to effect this purifying. See, Malachi here isn't talking about things which purify us or even God's use of things to purify us by the Holy Spirit. He refers to a person who purifies us. He is like a refiner's fire, not just trials or persecutions. He is like a refiner's fire. He shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi, and he shall purge them as gold and silver. This is what Christ does. He does it. And he purifies the sons of Levi, every last one of them, and again we'll define who they are later, he does this as the messenger of the covenant. The one who is the personal enfleshment or embodiment of the covenant. Of the holy God of fire who gave covenant laws at Mount Sinai. They made Israel tremble. Chapter 1 verse 6 says, where is my honor? Where is my fear? You call me God. You call me Father. And you blatantly disrespect me. And you're weary at my service. And you grumble. The messenger of the covenant comes to enable us out of a true living faith to obey him. We can't have any more priests offering impure, worthless, mangy animals on God's altar. Chapter 1 says a lot about this. We can't have the sons of Levi living a wicked, ungodly lifestyle, causing people to despise the Lord. Chapter 2 deals with that. <coughs> Jesus Christ comes as the messenger of the covenant to impart the life and peace of the covenant. This is chapter 2, verse 5, a beautiful verse. My covenant was with him, Levi, and the sons of Levi, and the priests. My covenant was with him of life and peace. And Jesus Christ comes as the messenger of the covenant to bring life and peace, because he is the embodiment of the living God bringing life to us in the Holy Spirit. And peace means wholeness, completeness, he brings life and peace in the covenant of grace to cleanse us and to give us peace with God. And the argument of our text is that the messenger of the covenant will come, Jesus Christ. He will purify the sons of Levi, reforming them in their hearts and in their lives to effect a reformation in the land of Judah. 
The sons of Levi, we are told, will be purified and purged as silver and gold, verse 3. Then, verse 4, then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old and as in the former years, transforming the nation, transforming them pure, holy offerings brought to Jehovah. It's going to bring going to bring the land back to the way it used to be. Days of old. Former years. Pure worship as in the days of Joshua or David or Solomon or Hezekiah just to pick four <coughs> of the better days in Israel's earlier history. God will purify the priests. That will purify the offerings. That will purify the temple and that means the whole nation will be transformed. That's the picture. And that's the picture in Old Testament language that the Hebrew originally speaks of. But this, of course, you understand, teaches us the truth for today. Because all these things were written for our hope and for our comfort all these things in the Old Testament, upon whom the ends of the ages are come. This prophecy of the purification of the sons of Levi, then their sacrifices, then the temple, then the nation, was not actually fulfilled in Old Testament days after Malachi, for we have no record of such a reformation. Instead, the prophecy of our text was fulfilled in New Testament days, and that's obvious because the passage deals with the coming of the messenger of the covenant, who is Jesus Christ, and he was preceded by his messenger, who is John the Baptist, who prepared the way before him. So taking it chronologically, Malachi gives the prophecy, then comes Christ's messenger, John the Baptist, then comes Christ himself, the messenger of the covenant, and he purifies the sons of Levi. So it's not either the case that Malachi said there's coming a reformation, and then it didn't come in the 400 years of the remaining time before the Messiah, and then they sort of attached it to when Christ came. No, Malachi himself says that the purging and purifying of the sons of Levi will only come after the messenger, John the Baptist, and after the coming of Jesus Christ. So this prophecy then was fulfilled at the first coming of our Savior. It's being fulfilled in the pages of the four Gospels. The prophecy will also be fulfilled at Christ's second coming, which two dates now are separated by, from our perspective, a minimum of 2,000 years. And who knows how much longer we have. And we know this because Revelation chapter 6, in describing the second coming of Jesus Christ, uses the language of our text in Malachi 3. When Christ comes, and the heaven departs as a scroll, and the mountains and islands are shaken out of their places. Verse 14 of Revelation 6. The people cry out to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. And then comes this, verse 17. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? Who may abide the day of his coming and who shall stand when he appeareth? Malachi 3 verse 2. So you can say this prophecy is fulfilled with the first coming of Christ. Malachi 3 verse 1 indicates that. And you can say this prophecy is fulfilled at the second coming of Christ. Because Revelation 6 says who can stand when he appears. But the prophecy is fulfilled 
also throughout the whole New Testament dispensation. Because our text, and this especially in verses 2 and 3 and 4, our text speaks of an ongoing process of refining and purging. Christ comes and then he refines and purifies the sons of Levi, removing more and more dross and making us more and more pure as gold. Which brings us to the identity of the sons of Levi. The sons of Levi, whom Malachi predicts will be purified, could be, could be, the whole tribe of Levi. Or it could be a more specific reference to the priests, who are special people in the tribe of Israel under the ceremonial law. And if you look back with me to Malachi 1 verse 6, you'll see that Malachi 1 verse 6 contains the line, O priests that despise my name. And then it talks about the polluted sacrifices which they offer. The priests are key. Then in chapter 2 verse 1, And now, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. And God says he's going to spread dung upon their faces because of the way they've despised him. Verse 7 says, The priests' lips should keep knowledge. But you, verse 8, have caused many to stumble at the law, and you priests have corrupted the covenant of Levi. Verse 8 continues. The priests are meant chiefly and first of all by the sons of Levi here, but then the priests don't do their work without the assistance of the Levites. So it applies ultimately to the whole tribe of Levi, particularly the priests and then secondarily the Levites. So they are the ones who are going to be purified. And if you want to take that literally and see how that works, well, John the Baptist was a priest. Barnabas, who accompanied Paul on his first missionary journey, he was a Levite. And Acts 6 talks about converted priests. But then John the Baptist, he's the forerunner for Christ, the one who prepares the way for him. And then Barnabas and the converted priests and Levites, they really only make up a tiny proportion even of the Jewish converts, never mind of the whole Catholic Church. Catholic meaning universal. The sons of Levi here then refer to the elect of all the nations of the earth. We are the sons of Levi. Not we exclusively, but all of God's believing people, whatever their genealogical tree may be, those who are born of the Spirit. And this is the case because this is what actually happened. Malachi 3 verses 1 through 4 says that Christ is going to come to purify the sons of Levi. And when Christ came after John the Baptist, what did he do? He purified a largely Gentile church. The sons of Levi then are all believers, most of whom are actually Gentiles. And if you look back to Malachi 1 verse 11, because we're not to interpret Malachi's prophets individualistically, and without reference to his other predictions, Malachi 1 verse 11 says, From the rising of the sun, think now of course of the east, or perhaps even Japan, the land of the rising sun, from the rising of the sun even to the going down of the same way in the west, that is the whole world, east and west, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. That's the Catholic Church, universal. And in every place, not just in Judah, and certainly not only in the temple, in every place, defined by east and west, the whole world, in every place, incense shall be offered unto my name, and only priests could offer incense in the Old Testament. The essence of the incense really is prayer. Psalm 141, Revelation 5 and 8 teach us, incense will be offered unto my name, who by 
the Gentiles, people all around the earth, you don't need to be in Jerusalem or at the temple, as I've said, and a pure offering shall be offered unto my name in every place. That is, sacrifices of praise and worship by the Gentiles all around the world, which means the end of the Old Testament nation of Israel as that particular chosen nation in its fulfillment in the Catholic Church, and it means the end of the Old Testament priesthood, and therefore the end of the Levites who serve them because a higher order has been reached. And all this saith the Lord of hosts. And so in Malachi 1 verse 11 is, makes it really clear that with the coming of John the Baptist and the Messiah and the purifying of the sons of Levi, since we're already told that Gentiles are going to offer incense and sacrifices, the two main things that Israelites offered in the Old Testament, it can't be literal. It must, it does, refer to the New Testament church of Jesus Christ. And the largely Gentile church of which we are members, all of us, young and old, male and female, we're called the sons of Levi because God makes a covenant of life and peace with us. The covenant of life and peace was made with the sons of Levi. Chapter 2, verse 5. We are now the sons of Levi. A covenant of life and peace. And we have exactly the same work, spiritually, as the priests in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, yes, there was that aspect of slaughtering animals, sprinkling their blood upon the altar, and then consuming these animals in the flames. But here's Hebrews 13, the New Testament book that explains the ceremonial law most fully. Hebrews 13, verse 15, By Christ, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit, not of the soil or of the flocks, but the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. Offering sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving. But to do good, good works, and to communicate or share, forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased not only praise and thanksgiving but two more sacrifices we offer good works and sharing for with such sacrifices God is well pleased the sons of Levi this is the teaching of Malachi 3 the sons of Levi foreshadow the New Testament church of Jesus Christ we're the greater reality to which they point. And when the reality comes, the literal sons of Levi, that Old Testament shadow, ceases to be significant and is terminated as completely unnecessary. Because now we are a royal priesthood, kings and priests unto our God. First Peter 2, verse Nine. And this is the subject we've been looking at the last few weeks in our Tuesday Bible study, which is also in part the origin of this sermon. And so the Old Testament distinction between priests and people, with priests being a higher level of people, that's the way it was in the days before Christ, <coughs> is forever abolished. The priesthood of all believers, all offer sacrifices in the New Testament Israel. And all are God's priests. And so Jesus Christ then refines the sons of Levi, puts them through the purging fires, as it were, by his Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is in effect the refiner's fire of the New Testament sons of Levi. For Jesus himself said, that he was going with his Holy Ghost to baptize with the Holy Ghost and with fire. The fiery Holy Ghost. A purifying, refining fire. So it is that the Holy Spirit applies the work of Jesus Christ to us, which was performed on the cross, 
There Christ obtains the right to make us as gold. And there principally the Lord Jesus washed away all the dross of our own sins. And there was a lot of slag that had to be siphoned off. A lot of impurities and filth. And Jesus obtained the right to do this. That is apply the heat, the fire to us. Because he in the first instance went through a far greater heat and fire, the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God against all the sins of his elect body. I use the figure of 1,064 degrees centigrade for the melting point of gold. This was far fiercer. The infinite wrath of the Holy God against sin. And now the messenger of the covenant, by his Holy Spirit, brings us into friendship with the Father, through the Son, and by the Holy Spirit. We have life within us. Therefore we're dead to sin. We don't live unto sin. And this life means the putting away of evil hatreds and purging ourselves by grace. And we fellowship with God in the covenant of grace, of life and peace through Jesus, so that we avoid enmity and strife in our homes. We hear that, boys. We do that. And girls. We put away strife because we're in a covenant of life and peace. And the husbands and wives need to hear this too, because we don't want this sort of enmity and strife in our households. And since we fellowship with God through the covenant of peace, we don't need to run to contaminated sources for our enjoyment, polluting, evil. Christ is busy refining us, and we're not going to be polluting ourselves, knowing that that's his work to do the opposite. And the Lord Jesus Christ uses his Spirit, who applies to us the word so that we break our ungodly alliances so that we don't speak evil or foul things and we dedicate ourselves to the Lord which refining work of Christ by his spirit is completed especially at death or the coming of Jesus Christ now we need to emphasize that this purifying and refining work of Jesus Christ is experienced by each and every believer as heat. A fierce heat. We feel God burning against our sins. And we ourselves then in turn burn against our transgressions in the way of repentance. We're angry at ourselves. 2 Corinthians 7 speaks of this too. And this involves too, where necessary, confession of our sins one to another. And then we have the fiery conflict. Am I going to confess my sins or am I going to cover it up? And of course you can never really cover up sins. They only get bigger and you only make things worse. We experience this fire too when we are placed in God's providence before evil which gives earthly reward and before good and then the battle rages within us what am I going to do and individually the messenger of the covenant who purifies the sons of Levi and who sits and watches us individually being purified when all the dross is taken away, he looks into the refining pot and sees us, the gold. And in a sense, what does he really see? He sees his own reflection. Pure gold. We reflect his image more and more. That's the goal of our salvation. 
All things work together for good for those who love God, who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, them he also predestinated to be conformed to the image of his Son. That's the good to which all things work together. The creating the creation of us in the image of God. And then we're clothed in Christ's righteousness on the last day, and that's evident, and in the image of God with an inward transformation. Well, there's no doubt we will be able to stand, unlike the wicked who cry out to the mountains and the hills to cover them. And if we widen this out from the individual to the corporate aspect, the ones who seek the Messiah, who delight in the messenger of the covenant, the churches that Jesus Christ is purifying by his word and spirit, their offerings are pleasing to the Lord. Praise, thanksgiving, sharing. And what was the other one? Doing good, good works. Those four mentioned in Hebrews 13. Like the faithful churches, as in the days of old and as in the former years, the days of Joshua, David, Solomon, Hezekiah, the apostles, the reformers, and that's where we stand. That's what God does. Very quickly then, the corollary. What about those who are not refined? Well, those who are not refined are judged. And our text presents the work of the messenger of the covenant under two figures. Verses 2 through 4, the one we've been looking at, speaks about the messenger of the covenant as a refiner at his oven, purifying the sons of Levi. And verse 5, our focus now, speaks of the messenger of the covenant as a witness in a courtroom testifying against certain people and condemning them for their sins. Remember the wearisome words, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, where is the God of judgment? Well, you were asking for it, you wicked in Israel. Now you've got it. Where is he? Well, I'm going to come near to you, to judgment, verse 5 says. And I will come near to you to judgment as a swift witness. I'm going to witness swiftly against you because I have all the facts in my omniscience of all of your sins. I have all the facts ready to hand so I don't even need to consult my notes, says God. All the touch of a finger. A swift witness. And the swift witness too doesn't need to sift through the counter evidence from the accused. There is none. We don't have a long drawn out court case of days and weeks and maybe even months dealing with red herrings and specious pleading and lame excuses and all the rest of it. I'll be a sweet, a swift witness. You will be condemned because every mouth will be stopped and all the world will become guilty before God. And then all the ones against whom God witnesses through the messenger of the covenant in verse 5, they belong chiefly to two categories. I'll be a swift witness against the sorcerers, the adulterers, and the false swearers. The adulterers are those who married the daughters of the strange gods mentioned in chapter 2, which then brought them over to idolatry, as chapter 2 says, in that they worshipped the pagan gods of their wives. And that was full swearing because they broke their oaths to their first wives, who were Israelites, whom they divorced, to marry these pagan women. I'll be a swift witness against you. And this shows the people who are grumbling, people who broke their wedding oaths, their marriage oaths, committed adultery, and ran after idolatry. Where's the God of justice and judgment? I'm here, right here. And the other sins that are mentioned there are sins of oppression, oppressing the hireling and his wages, not paying people their dues, oppressing the widow, for she had no husband to protect her, the fatherless, little orphans, who had no orphan to care for them, and the strangers who were hated in Israel too and therefore abused 
because they didn't have proper connections. And the root of all these sins is described at the end of verse 5. The problem was, they didn't fear me. They didn't fear me. And that was why they were worshipping wickedly and offering polluted, mangy sacrifices in chapter 1. Since the people didn't fear God, why do we keep our oaths? Why not just commit adultery? Why not worship idols? And since we don't fear God, why not abuse all the weak, the strangers, the hirelings, the widows, the orphans, in order to fatten ourselves up? And then this way they showed that they despised God. And because they despised God, they did nothing but grumble and complain. Very swiftly, beloved. Our last point. The reason for all this. That's verse 6. Why is it that the messenger of the covenant, on the one hand, purifies his true people with fire, making us like gold, and not simply consume them, and on the other hand, why is it that the messenger of the covenant comes to destroy the wicked? Well, follow the argument in In our text. Verses 2 through 4. God says I am going to come and purify you. For verse 6. I am the Lord. The word for is a strong Hebrew word that gives a reason. I'm going to, to purify and not destroy you. For I am the Lord. And the word Lord. Or Jehovah. Comes from the verb to be. I am that I am. I am unchangeable. I am eternal. I am always faithful and true. I am the Lord. I change not. And therefore my covenant promise in Christ changes not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. And the point is that if ever there was any possibility in God to change, really change in himself or change in his plans, Even the good Israelites, the elect ones, by their sins, would occasion this change. But the salvation of the church lies in the utter immutability of God and his promises and his salvation and his work. Because he would be tempted to change by our sin. But since he's utterly immutable, he won't. I will save you, I will purify you and not destroy you. Because I am the unchangeable God. And if it wasn't for that, you'd be punished too. Just like the full swears and the adulterers. And that's our comfort as well. Because we're far from guiltless. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, bless to us thy word. That we may believe the truth. That we may readily yield and give ourselves up to thy work of purifying us even when it's hot and we wish that thou would cool the temperature upon us. Forgive our sins and we pray that thou be with us this Lord's day and with all thy needy people in Jesus' name. Amen.